Hi, and I'm Julie Roberts. Uh, I'm a community activist and organizer here in Arizona. But in the 90s, I did live in San Francisco and I'm very, very familiar with Curve and NCLR and the change from Deneuve to Curve. So it was very exciting for me to see everyone in the film, to see all the historic footage that was there. Um, it was like old hometown. It was like a virtual who's who of the lesbian world in San Francisco and California. So thank you, thank you very much for doing this film and reminding me of all this history or herstory as we used to say. It's an amazing film. But so the first question I'd like to ask is, how did you, first of all, find all of these women when you were doing Curve, when you were doing the magazine, and then how 20 years later, did you get them all to come in and join you in this film? Well, I'm Jen Rainin. I'm the director of the of Ahead of the Curve. And Hi, and I'm Rivka Bethmeadow. I'm the producer and co-director of Ahead of the Curve. So Franco is, uh, she is still in touch with or even close friends with a lot of the folks that you see in the film. Uh, so it was kind of easy um, for a lot of those women. Um, she and I have been involved in, in, with NCLR for a lot of years, so reaching out to Kate was pretty easy. I was thrilled when Kate said she would be willing to participate. Um, Jewel Gomez immediately said yes, I think because um, she, has, she and Franco have mutual respect for each other. Um, Leah Delaria said yes, and then was very, very hard to, uh, to actually find the time to, um, to work with because she's in so much, she's in so many fantastic uh, productions right now. So her schedule is very, very tight. Um, and I will, uh, Rivka and I will be delighted to tell you that story is a very, um, <laughs> it's a crazy story how we managed to get her in the film. Um, Melissa Etheridge, uh, is not somebody that Frank is in regular contact with. Um, and I was wildly intimidated reaching out. And um, I uh, was up late one night thinking, okay, deep breath. I'm gonna, I found who I think are the agents for all of these people. And I'm gonna reach out to, um, you know, the person I was, I was thinking, well, I'd like to get Martina Navratilova. I think that'd be really great because she was the cover of the first issue of Curve after the name change. So I reached out to the person who I believe represented Martina and I got, um, I woke up the next morning, you know, this was a late night, and I got an email back saying, I do not now, nor have I ever represented Martina Navratilova. And I went, <gasps> who is it that I sent this to? So I did a bunch of quick research and I called Riv kind of panic and said, oh my gosh, it was Melissa Etheridge's rep that I reached out to and asked for Martina. Oh, oh what do I do? So yeah. Riff, you, you want to tell what happened next? Because it was crazy and awesome. Well, that was, you reached out to me at about 6 a.m. So yeah. I knew something was going on and I was like, oh, oh my gosh, right? And so then I think we were maybe on the phone when uh, you replied and said something about the email demons or With the the evil, evil, evil gremlins. email gremlins who yeah, yeah um were possessing you and <laughs> then I think we were still on the phone just a few minutes later when the agent got back and was like yep stuff happens uh I'll reach out to Melissa and then Melissa said yes which was really special because she was the first person to tell Franco yes as you know and be, she was the first celebrity on the cover of Deneuve. So let me ask, did you have any issues with the historical filming? And where did it all come from, from 30 years ago? Where did you get all the footage and the pictures and the images of everyone? My garage. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Franco saved everything. <laughs> very sentimental person, my wife, you know, and, um, for a few years, I, I found that less than endearing. There was just so much stuff in my garage. And it wasn't organized, it was everywhere. And then as we started to do this project, I started to develop a deep appreciation for her sentimentality because there was a treasure trove in the garage. And so we got it all organized. Rivka was in my garage this morning. She can attest. 
it's beautifully organized. <laughs> we had all this fantastic uh, footage for this film. <laughs> yeah, we also, people were so great. You know, Paige Hodel, who was a DJ, maybe you went to her Club Q. She had, she actually was obsessively documenting every Club Q dance. So she had a lot of video to share with us. And then we also went down to the June Mazer archive, which was fantastic. They were really generous. Yeah, Paige had a literal, like a, a big table, like a desk piled like, it's a screen, you can't tell, like a couple feet high <laughs> with these little, like those mini DV tapes, like so, like a mound, like Santa had just dumped out his, you know, bag of goodies and it's all this lesbian parties. And I thought, please <laughs> let the Alive and Kicking fundraiser be in there. Please let it be in there. And I, I just said a little prayer to the god of the lesbian, the goddess of the lesbians, obviously a goddess. And, uh, and then I got a text from Paige a, a week later with a picture of a bunch of the, the things. And she said, zoom in, zoom in. And there it was. It said, alive and kicking on the side of this tape. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> you know, it's so many moments like that just made me feel like this film was just meant to be. Like, we had to make this film, you know. So I'd like to open this up uh, to the other members here from the festival to see if they would like to ask a question of either one of you at this time. More of a thanks on my part. Um, you know, as, as a gay man who uh, had trouble coming out of his own skin when he discovered it in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, you know, your journey and, and the journey to start a magazine two magazines, let alone um, uh, being able to help people identify with um, their part of the community and then broadening the entire community as a whole, your, your documentary really achieved that. And, and I can't tell you how excited I am for you that this is out and you know, you've, you've reached beyond the lesbian uh, community. And, and I think it's, it's a great testament to, to um, how, how you're persevering. Well, that just makes our Liz little queer hearts sing. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a joy, especially, I mean, it's uh, all, every part of this now is a joy, but it's a, it's a, spe it's a special place in my heart for, um, for the, for the gay men, uh, who see this and the trans people who see this and the non-binary people who see this film and say, oh, you know, like I, I had no idea. I didn't know this story. This is such an important story. This is great. You know, like now I feel much better informed. We don't have, there aren't enough uh, well-resourced films about queer women's history. Yeah. As a result, we just, we don't know it. Like there's just, there's a, there's a few stories that we all know and we cling to them. But I mean, if you look, the, really the vast majority of queer films are, are directed at men. They're telling men's stories, which we love. And <laughs> no, no you, you, you hit the mark. Was there anything that happened that surprised you in the filming or the setting up of the filming? Perhaps a, a big aha moment or a, oh my God, I can't believe that happened moment. Well, other than the Martina and the Melissa confusion. Franco, you want to take that? Um, I mean, I'd say that, uh, well, initially we had gone into this film. Jen had been working on the film for, you know, at least a year before I came on board and really doing um, yeoman's work with uh, pre-interviews and getting a really incredible biopic together around Franco's life and journey. Her story is incredible. And then, you know, we were, we were more than halfway through filming and we had thought we were finished with filming and we were looking at sort of the way um, Franco's work in the 90s and the aughts really has shaped our present moment and the inclusivity and intersectionality we see around uh, queer women's leadership and activism today. So when Franco got the call from Silka saying that the magazine was gonna fail within a year we had a lot of uh, assessing to do about, you know, how we were going to shift this film. So that was a pretty big curve ball. 
Nice. I see what you did there. That was cool. Yeah. Yeah. There was more, there were a lot of surprises. We, I, Franco probably most of all, but we were all pretty surprised um, learning how many young women are identifying with the word lesbian. We really thought that it was dying out and certainly it has gone through some ups and downs, but we were pleasantly surprised by that. Um, we were also surprised um, when we really dug in to see how much under attack our rights still are. You know, I, I was one of those folks who really thought, oh, we've got marriage equality now. Like, we're good. We pretty much have equal rights. We really do not. <laughs> we really do not. And then I was surprised again when right after, of course, we burned the DCP, the like the the film on into its sort of permanent um, vehicle so that you all can show it. Uh, right after that, the Supreme Court, bless them, uh, came, decided that we should have uh, uh, employment equality, which was amazing. So I was surprised by that. I was also surprised that that didn't actually change the film very much. <laughs> I, we literally have to take out only two words that Rhea uh, Tabaco Mar says, and the, the film is still 100% current. So that was another surprise. <laughs> Jen. In your director's statement, you spoke about the words that define our community, how we use the word lesbian, how we use the word queer. You know, in that time, we even had to reclaim the words dyke and, and faggot and, and so many of those words that were used against us in the past. We claimed them, we went with them, and we turned all those negative words into something that we were proud of. But now that we've reclaimed all of those, we Today, there is so much tendency towards self-identity of each one of us, uh, definition of pronouns, uh, gender fluidi fluidity, uh, cisgender, all of these different terms that I'm not that familiar with. But do you think that our sense of self-identifying, identifying ourselves as individuals, has an effect on our community, on us being seen as one community altogether? Oh, that's a really juicy question. Um, I was actually, we were, I was just talking with Kim Patrick this morning about that very thing. Um, I, it certainly has an effect. I think for some of us, some folks, there's been some concern that, ah, oh, you know, if we are, if we're embracing all of these different identities, like, what are we? Is there, are we like, and also, like, what does that do for our credibility outside of community? Do people just look at us and roll their eyes and say, well, they're just too difficult? Um, <laughs> I mean, and maybe, I don't know, but I'm, the older I get, the less concerned I am about how the outside of community folks think about me and us. Um, but I also am starting to really feel pretty strongly that, that by you know, like we are in a such a different place than we were when that magazine started. 30 years ago, like being able to say, I'm a, like, I wasn't out. I couldn't say I'm a lesbian 30 years ago. I couldn't. It was dangerous. It was scary. I was completely isolated. That is, that is a reality for some folks now, but for far fewer. And I, I think, I'm going to go out on a little limb here. Feel free to throw rocks. Uh, but I think that we have evolved so much and uh, that our culture, our society has become more cognizant and more accepting that there are, there is a range of ways that we all show up in the world. Um, that it's allowing, particularly the younger folks who are coming up and who, who never knew uh, maybe some of the fight that we had to endure when we were coming up, that it is allowing them to expand and explore more of the breadth of, um, of their own identities. And I think that it's quite marvelous that, um, you know, that we are beginning to have all of these words and ways of identifying. I mean, I don't know. It's, I'm just, I'm gonna be really curious to watch over the next couple of decades, several decades, like, does it then 
begin to settle? Do we contract into something more of an umbrella term? Does everybody just start saying queer? And then when we, you know, you want to understand a little bit more about an individual, we just ask. So when you say queer, what does that mean for you? You know, like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like we're getting into, I mean, maybe we'll look back in a couple of decades and say, wow, this is actually really the golden age for queer folks. This, this incredible expansion happening, like a renaissance in a way. You know, I love what Frankie said about how she got the name from of Curve when she was changing from Deneuve to Curve. You know, the the curvaceous hills of the Bay, Bay Area and how that just seemed to fit even better than the word Deneuve, how curve seemed to fit who we were and who we were trying to say we were. But what I don't know is, you know, where are we now? Where, where have we gone? Can you tell me? I can try. I mean, I'm no expert here, but I am in conversation around this topic a lot, especially as we're launching the Curve Foundation. So Franco and I, you know, because you saw the film, Franco and I are now working with Kate Kendall and, uh, and a really extraordinary group of, of women to launch the Curve Foundation. And thinking about, you know, how, just the other day we met with our advisors and kind of settled on like, you know, it's probably better right now as things are expanding so much to um, be as inclusive as possible and use as many words as we need to, to include our community, even if it feels a little clunky, um, because I think a lot of folks have been feeling excluded for a long time. So yeah, I, I don't actually know really the answer, <laughs> um, but you know, we, it, I think it also depends on what exactly you're referring to. I mean, Rifka and I talk about this a lot around Frankly Speaking Films, which is our production company that we are um, building to tell more stories about uh, queer and non-binary people, queer women and non-binary people. And we're having to, to really think about the language that we use, the words that we use to be as specific as possible and as expansive as possible. I don't know, it's, it's a really interesting balancing act. I, I can't really give you an answer better than that I don't think but it is but here's what I know we have as a community we have to keep talking about it and we have to, to, to speak and cross generationally because if we just all talk with the you know our peers who are the same age we all have similar experience or we often have similar experience and we it's I mean it just I learned in the making of this film and speaking with folks um, much younger than myself and Franco um, I learned so much um, and they learned as well, just hearing, well, what was the logic behind putting the word lesbian and only the word lesbian on the cover? You know, it, it, it helps, it helps us all get closer and stronger. As we look back over the last 30 years and the impact that Curve has made on all of us and of course all those other women who had to carry the boxes other than Frankie, what did you all learn what is the most important thing that you learned about our community in creating this film? Go over it, wanna, um, I think it's just the really deep need for us to be the authors of our own stories and really bringing those stories to audiences and helping empower them to tell their stories too. I think that really, that, you know, Kim Katrin talks a lot about that in our film and you know, when we look at Franco's legacy and also what Franco did, Franco amplified all kinds of women's voices at a time when it, that wasn't happening, right? And so now we see we have a lot of platforms for that. We have a lot of, um, you know, uh, people have the ability through social media to speak directly to their audiences. Um, but there are still a lot of arenas in which there are other people telling our stories if they're telling you know any stories at all um, about queer community so i think it's really that we've got um we we need to be telling our own stories i would add to that that we need to be not waiting for permission or an invitation to tell our own stories mm -hmm. you know that i learn that every day from franco 
Yeah. <laughs> so what goes along with that too is that we support our other storyteller stories, right? Like we support each other's films and we support each other's social media and we really stay engaged in conversation. I'm going to open up the conversation for Marilyn and Ben to see if they have any questions before we begin our wrap up. I just have a fangirl thing. It was great to see Leah and Melissa and to um, hear about Lucy Lawless that she was the the favorite interview because I'm um, a big Xena fan and I have lesbian friends really across the world because of that show and and that was in 1995 when the internet uh, you know started and so we all met each other but um, I'm sure I have my Curve magazine with Lucy on it in my garage in one of my uh, containers here. I've got to go pull it out and look at it. But um, I enjoyed the film. It was awesome. And I love hearing about uh, lesbian history. I think you're right. I don't think we have enough stories and we don't haven't done that. And to uh, learn about the the uh, how Curve began and Denerve and it was just, wonderful and I enjoyed it and I thank you. Thank you. That makes me feel really good. <laughs> I kind of I kind of feel like I need to share the Leah Deliria story. Would you mind? Yeah. So as mm -hmm. I mentioned we you know we reached out and she was open but um you know to her schedule was so busy we tried what three times we had it scheduled and then at the last minute or whatever like it just didn't work because of her shooting schedule. And uh, Rivka and I were in New York um, uh, doing something else for the film, taking meetings and doing the thing. And, um, you know, we had four days of that. And the last night uh, we were done with our work and I took my niece to the theater because that's what I do when I go to New York. <laughs> I take my niece to the theater. And we got there a little early, which is totally not characteristic of me. And my niece is looking around at all the people and I'm just looking at the playbill. And my niece says, who is that person sitting behind us? She looks so familiar. And I turned around and it's Leah Delaria. And I said, Leah, hi, I'm Ben Rainin with the head of the curve. Uh, you were supposed to be in my movie. And she very generously, you know, put out her hand. And, oh my gosh, yes, I was. Gosh, I'm so sorry this didn't happen. Any chance we could do it tomorrow? I, I just happened to be available. I'm doing, I'm doing a, uh, ADR, she was uh, doing some voiceover work in the morning, but you know, I'm free at noon. Could we just do it uh, tomorrow? And so it's seven, it's uh, like 6.57 or something like this. And I said, I can try, you know, make it happen. We were meant to be flying out the next day in the afternoon. So I went back to my seat and I uh, frantically texted Rivka, who was back at the Airbnb and said, oh my gosh, <laughs> is there any way we can do this? Holy cow. What do you think? And then the curtain went up, and that was it for me for a couple of hours, and um, it was amazing. Uh, as, as the curtain goes back down, huge ovation. Leah says, "You know, let me know. You know, you all have my contact information." And uh, Rivka had worked like a maniac for two hours, and continued to work for several hours after that, all through the night. And we managed to pull it together. But boy, it was skin of teeth. Like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know there were so many tiring well, bar what with the details, but it was a small miracle, medium-sized miracle that we were able to, you know, rush from our meeting the next morning um, to uh, pick up the, what did we pick up a battery or something? And, and I picked me up and you picked up the crew and went to the space and we had it all set up and Leah came in and she was extraordinary. Oh. And yeah. got in the car and went straight to the airport and left. <laughs> meant, yeah. to be. meant to be. It was meant to be. Meant to be. Like so many yeah. things. So. Yeah, she's been amazing too, Leah. And since we filmed with her, she's also been really generous in supporting the film and appearing and talking on behalf of the film. Yeah. Can you please, Jen, and uh, let us know how people can stay in touch with you and with the film? How can they follow it? Uh, how can they follow the releases that you might have on social media or particular websites? And how can they find out more about what's going on in the future, perhaps regarding the foundation? So 
you can follow us at on our website at curvemagmovie.com. Um, you can find upcoming screenings there. You can find us on all socials at Curve Mag Movie. Um, and we are working now towards a broad release. Uh, we're hoping for late spring. Maybe in the theaters, right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. That'd be great. <laughs> Have you been able to screen this in front of people at all? Uh-huh. Ripper, you want to tell? <laughs> yeah. So we were uh, looking at our premiere, which was with Frameline, and we got the chance to do a special Pride edition of Frameline. Frameline was doing, invited a few films to do a Pride weekend screening online. And Jen and I got together and we just thought like, we really need to do this in person if we can. And um, I, had a, I had a notion, I'd been to a drive-in about 20 minutes outside of San Francisco or as like 30 minutes outside of San Francisco. And I said, what if we get our audience to decorate their cars and dress up because, you know, the pride, in-person pride wasn't happening. And we can all go and watch Ahead of the Curve at the drive-in. Do you think they'll go for it? And then Frameline, they're incredible. Um, they were huge supporters. They were like, yes, let's try it. Let's do it, you know? And so we threw a huge, the largest, um, the largest event in Frameline history. we like a thousand cars. So 2,000 people came to a see us. Amazing. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yep. Wearing masks and dancing, distant, socially distant. Yeah, it was, it was a huge cathartic moment for us, for sure. But to be able to be with um, our community was really incredibly special. Absolutely. And we've done a couple of other drive-ins. We did Outfest did a drive-in, uh, which also sold out. It wasn't a thousand cars, but it was lovely. So, and Frank and I drove down to LA for that. And, and but that's it for the in-person. It's yeah. a little bittersweet. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for all your time and your energy and your work and your dedication to our community. I don't think that I can say enough nice words. I love the film. It was so nice to see some of you, all of those places and all of the faces that I remember from 20 odd years ago. So I appreciate it. And I'm going to watch it again tonight with my girlfriend. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. We're Thank excited you to you. So We're much. really honored to be included in this festival. Thank you so much for having us. Thank yeah. you so much. We appreciate it. Good luck with the film. And um, we'll tell you, we'll let you know how it goes at our festival. We're looking forward to it. So. Yeah, it'll be great. Thank you. So I want to thank the sponsors. Uh, I want to quite thank Equality Arizona and the Phoenix Pride here. Uh, of course, uh, Paradise Valley Community College, who has been the homestay of the whole festival for all of these years. And then, of course, we have the Maricopa Community College's foundation, which helps us with foundations for LGBT youth and uh, is very supportive of our program. Thank you all.